Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of today's organizer, VNU Asia Pacific and DLG International, a very warm welcome to the first Agitechnica Asia Digital Talks, Crop Protection Under Pressure, how to deal with it in practical farming. At the same time, starts the matchmaking platform Agitechnica Asia and Horti Asia Digital. We are asking manufacturers, farmers, dealers, finally the whole agricultural community to register. After that, they can communicate among themselves and gather helpful information. Today, we have October 14. Usually, we would have celebrated the opening ceremony of Agitechnica Asia and Horti Asia, but because of well-known, very special circumstances, for instance, travel restrictions, we decided to postpone the show to May 27 to 29 in 2021. Until then, we will run the matchmaking platform. And in addition, we monthly digital talks will take place. We in New Asia Pacific and DLG International, in close and fruitful collaboration, are more than pleased to offer these digital platforms and talks to all our clients, helping them to outlast these challenging times. And we seriously wish to welcome all of you in 2021 in May in Bangkok in person. And now I want to hand over to Dr. Klaus Ertle, who is our moderator for today. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Koch, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our first Digital Connect talk in course of the Architechnica Asia and Horti Asia. My name is Klaus Ertle from the uh, competence in the agriculture of the DLG. And according to the attendance list, we do have listeners and uh, people joining the talk from all over the world. We have people from Southeast Asia, from Africa, Europe, North and South America. This tells us that the topic chosen for today is a global one. Plant protection under pressure, how to deal with it in practical farming. That's a big question. It's an increasing challenge for farmers in nearly every region of the world to protect their crops accordingly, as many active agents used so far very successfully are banned or are in discussion to be banned. Of course, there are reasons for such bans, such as environmental and health aspects we cannot neglect. At the same time, farmers are urgently looking for ways to keep some of the most important active agents or ask for, uh, for alternatives. Today, I'm really proud to have speakers with us who have a lot of experience in that regard. And also these guests are usually very busy. They managed to join us and share their knowledge. I already want to say thank you for your time. Before we start with the talks, I want to let you know that everybody who is listening to this talk can ask questions to the speakers by using the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. Please use it and we will bring these questions to the platform. And now I want to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Veronica, who is talking about the actual status on Thailand's app agriculture after Paraquat Benny. So Dr. Veronica, the stage is yours. Hi, good morning and uh, good afternoon in Thailand. Um, I'm Dr. Veronika Nakavajara Beddinghaus from Thai Agricultural Innovation Trade Association. And today, um, in general, actually, um, I would like to talk on um, the current status of um, the agricultural sector as a whole. Um, 
not in particular on you know uh, any compound or anything, but the situation in Thailand, as as you know, that um, we were exposed to uh, the ban of the major crop protection compounds. And um, as for glyphosate, uh, the decision has been made to keep it under restricted use. That means that the farmers and the retailers have to have the training and pass the test so they can have the certification to use or to buy uh, the compounds. And um, that is very fortunate for us. But um, we still have the other two compounds that have been banned with the effective date since the 1st of June this year. And that has created us and put us in the position of um, a real hardship for the farmers, actually, because, you know, once they have been taken out, I would call, you know, I, I would call these compounds as a necessity in life for the farmers, um, because the, in Thailand, you have major economic crops that still require the compounds that have been banned. And um, the consultation with the key stakeholders, which are farmers, actually, who, who is the, the, the primary um, stakeholders in, in this, hasn't been consulted. And even if um, they have made the voices, but uh, their voices haven't been heard, but in Thailand and for us in the industry, the most important thing before we make any decision on banning any, you know, support agricultural substance support for the farmers, um, we need to consult the stakeholders, which are farmers. So um, let me go back to the principle of uh, regulating agricultural technologies and innovation. We as the as the R and D um, and the plant science um, bodies, we respect the fact of the risk and the benefit based decision. But the decision that has been made in Thailand hasn't been, you know, um, following that principle. So that is the reason why, why um, the farmers are left with nothing. Um, like, for example, you know, uh, you're taking the most effective tools that they are using to do their farming from their hands and um, where are they left at, correct? And um, the banning reason is, is just, you know, it, it's, it's not scientific base, it's about emotional base. The consumers come out and, you know, they, they, they get the communications on the social media that uh, they found residues and vegetables and fruits and things. So it's about emotion that they fear that they are consuming unsafe, crops. So, um, um, and also the communications that come out is about, you know, uh, the, the toxicity of, of um, agricultural chemical. So that is the reason it's about health related issues. That is the reason for the ban, despite the fact that um, the scientific proof, medical proof have been submitted, but um, still, you know, um, the decision, the decision has been made. And um, the farmers or the stakeholders themselves have already submitted the petition. But uh, then again, you know, the ban has been done only just uh, on the 1st of June. So uh, you don't see a great impact that has been caused by the ban as yet. So um, uh, the decision has been made to maintain uh, the ban for, for the time being without realizing that, you know, even if the effect hasn't been shown or, uh, and any solid proof that, you know, um, is damaging agricultural sector as a whole. But um, let me talk about only two major economic crops, which is sugarcane and cassava. The sugarcane uh, production is at 32 million metric ton per year. And that is the value at 2.7 billion US dollars. While, uh, oh, sorry, that is cassava, but sugarcane itself is 19 million metric ton. That is the value of 450 million US dollars per year. That doesn't include um, the extension products that is made from these two crops as yet. So you, you can see that, you know, without having to, to give any reasons of, you know, the damage that will be occurring or, or happening to Thailand agricultural sector, 
only these two crops alone has created a lot of damage, but since the damage has not been done yet, so uh, the decision has been made um, as it has been made. And if you ask me, um, what could the, the representative of the key stakeholders or the industry can do? I would not say that we can do anything to change the decision as of now, because the solid damage has not been proved. But um, what the industries are doing and have, have been doing actually all along for the past 30, 40 years, 50 years since the compound exists in Thailand, is that uh, we work very closely with the government, um, uh, Department of Agriculture, Department of Agriculture Extension, to ensure that the farmers are well aware of how to use these compounds responsibly, safely, to protect themselves, to protect the environment, and also to protect the consumers at the end. And, um, and we continue, and that is the commitment from the industry to the Thailand industry, that we will continue to work closely with the government to ensure that across the board of the farmers in Thailand are well trained of how they use the products. Um, fortunately, and I, I must say that we are very lucky in Thailand that we have three major associations that um, is about agricultural association, which is um, us, Taita, and another association that has been established for, for so long is the Thai Crop Protection Associations. And another association is um, the Thai Business, Agricultural Business Association. These three major associations work very closely together in harmony to support the government in bringing in the latest technology of crop protection into Thailand. And um, the key important things is our responsibility to our farmers is to train the farmers to use it correctly and, and responsibly, as I have um, told you in the beginning, and not also to use the compounds responsibly, but you know, throughout the cycle of, of using these compounds and also how to manage um, the empty container, and, and that is also being trained. And we also work very closely with the environmental department to ensure that uh, the industry is responsible and the farmers are responsible in getting rid of their empty containers uh, correctly. Um, the thing that, that, um, that worries me the most about the banning of any agricultural compound is you know, when I would call, I would call uh, the compound is the necessity, one of the necessity in lives of the farmers. When you ban it, you know, the thing, the consequence that will come after, not only to damage the economy, but um, you are encouraging the illegal and the counterfeit products that will enter the market. And that would be the, um, a real disaster to, to, to the farmers or to the environmental itself because all those illegal and counterfeit products hasn't been proved or registered by the Department of Agriculture. So you don't know, you know um, the safety of those products. And, and that is also the consequence that will come after the banning of any compound. So um, I would say, you know, um, to pre prevent Thailand from, from, you know, facing this situation, and uh, I would say it's a disaster, is for any party or any organization, enterprise whatsoever, that propose the ban should consult the farmers first, because the farmers are the key stakeholder, it's the primary stakeholder that you are affecting their work, their profession, and most importantly, their livelihood, and also the food security in Thailand. So, um, I believe that um, that is a key issue. And um, talking about alternatives, I would say that the compounds that have been banned, we, we don't really have, you know, 100% alternatives or substitutes that can replace. Um, I must say, I, I have to mention the name of the compound, Paraquat. In Thailand, you know, it, we are in the tropical zone and um, Throughout the year, we have a lot of rain uh, period that have a rainy season. So it's encouraging the weeds to grow really fast. 
but taking the most effective compound out of, of Thailand. How, how, how can we survive? You know, you suggest machinery, you suggest, you know, um, manpower to go and do weeding. But in Thailand, you know, even the minimum wage is set at 300 baht per day. But uh, the people who would go out and do the weeding, the, the, the wages is not 300 baht, it's 600 baht, which is double. So uh, one person cannot even do, you know, one quarter of what um, the weed control compound can do. And um, at the same time, you can't find the labor. And uh, due to COVID-19 situation right now, we don't have foreign workers coming into the kingdom. So um, this is, you know, all the consequences that is happening that uh, we are living at, at uh, how to say, the corner that we don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. We are left at the corner and, and we, we really don't know how, how to handle the situation. Um, that is really a problem that I would suggest that um, the government also listens to the voice of the farmers. We as the industry, you know, business goes, goes on as usual. We are not coming here to fight, you know, for, for the ban to, not to ban it or, or to reopen the, the consideration. Life goes on, the business has to go on, even if they don't have the compound in their business portfolio anymore, they have to readjust their business plan. So the worries that we have to be honest is only about the survival of the farmers and agricultural sector in Thailand as a whole. So um, that would be for me. Okay, thank you, Dr. Boronica. And um, we see that you as a executive director of the Thai Agricultural Innovation Trade Association have a really sound uh, um, a view on the whole branch. So also from the farmers' point of view and also to the agribusiness, which is very important to bring those two parts together because else it won't function in, in, the, in the farming system. Thank you for the moment. And uh, everybody who has questions to Dr. Veronica, please use the Q&A. And as you mentioned already, there are very uh, different opinions coming from politics and also from the farmers and agribusiness side. And I hear out of your talk that we have a quite similar situation in Europe as well. And now I ask uh, Dr. Rebecca Dücke from the University of, um, of Göttingen in Germany to give uh, insight into the German situation about the banning of glyphosate, which is planned in Germany. So she will uh, give us an introduction to the current situation of active agents in Germany. Rebecca, stage is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. So I would like to switch over to the situation in Germany now. Glyphosate is the most frequently used herbicide in Germany and it has been used since 1975. Registration wise, it went relatively smoothly until 1991 where a two level registration system was introduced at the EU level which meant that the active ingredients are registered at the EU level and the formulated products are registered at the member state level. Glyphosate became authorized again, but the authorization expired in 2012. And due to massive overload of the responsible authorities, the re-registration process was postponed. But in the meantime, studies have come up that indicated potential harmful effects of glyphosate. And that led to a very controversial debate. 
The main topic of this debate was the cancerogenicity of glyphosate and there the IARC of the WHO had a different opinion on the safety of glyphosate in comparison to the EFSA and other authorities. The EFSA is also responsible for the registration of the compounds in Europe. So why was there actually a difference in the opinions? They evaluated a large number of studies in different ways. The IARC focused not only on the active ingredient, but also on several formulated products, which actually led to a quick ban of the co-formulant POEA, which was suspected to be involved in higher cancerogenicity levels observed in glyphosate product treatments. The EFSA, on the other hand, evaluated the active ingredient. Another difference was the evaluation at a hazard-based level and the evaluation of the risk of glyphosate, which includes the hazard and exposure. Putting different parts of the image of the safety of glyphosate together, this was added by studies with humans and the IARC focused on case control studies with humans. And there was a correlation between non-Hodgkin lymphoma and glyphosate use. However, there is a memory bias possible with this kind of studies, which is called recall bias. On the other hand, the EFSA um, focused on a cohort study uh, with more than 50,000 people in the US and there was no correlation between cancer and glyphosate. However, at the time, this study was not yet completed. And like this, they came to different conclusions. Yet, glyphosate was re-registered and prolonged until 2023. But what happens after 2023? Particularly since herbicides such as Paraquat or Glufosinate have already been banned in Germany. Well, the Glyphosate Renewal Group has applied for a new authorization of glyphosate last winter. And this started a three year process at the EU level. And at the end, it will be decided whether glyphosate will re be re-registered in the EU or not. Depending on this, the next step would be a registration of formulated products at the national level. And in Germany, this includes four different authorities, which take over different tasks. Particularly one authority, however, requests higher standards in order to protect the environment. This, together with several petitions, asking for a better protection of biodiversity have led led to an insect protection program. This has been decided by the government and is here represented by three of our ministers. This insect protection program requests first restrictions and then a ban of glyphosate. However, this has not yet become a national law. But what would this mean for the 37% of the arable land and the farmers that apply glyphosate on these 37% on average. Well, I would like to walk you through a typical season um, in agriculture in Germany and how, to use, how herbicides are used in that way. The first thing after harvest could be a glyphosate treatment, either a stubble treatment, which would be around about 22% of the treatments or a pre, uh, or a, it would, be on 22% of the fields or a pre-sowing treatment that would be on 12% of the fields. This, of course, is done for wheat and volunteer control. And this is particularly done when farmers are dealing with difficult weeds, weeds such as common couch or Canada thistle that regrow from rhizomes and are very difficult to control otherwise. Also, phytosanitary measures are important to kill, for example, certain volunteers or weeds that carry nematodes or virus diseases. But glyphosate is also becoming more and more important when it comes to resistant management. 
whether glyphosate treatment has been carried out or not, the next step would be to prepare the seed bed. And so the crop, winter wheat, would be our most important crop in late summer or autumn. Subsequently, typically a pre-emergence treatment would follow. And if this is not sufficient, also per early post-emergence herbicide treatments may follow. Then winter comes and weeds and crops stop growing altogether. And uh, then spring comes and both crops and weeds start growing again. Also new weeds will emerge and this will require spring treatments, typically with ALS or ACCAs inhibitors. Then the crop develops and no more herbicide treatments are typically done unless in very rare exceptions there could be a desiccation application before harvest, but this would really be the extreme exception and is not very um, appreciated. So what are the alternatives for the farmers that actually use glyphosate? The majority of the farmers who use glyphosate intensively have either large farms or rely on reduced tillage. And particularly for these farmers, but in general, mechanical weed control is the solution for the problem. So when we look at those farms, there is the trend to use ultra shallow tillage, which would be at the top two to three centimeters, as we see here with this disc cutter, which would be efficient. Um, so it would require less time in comparison to older techniques, but also less uh, would require less fuel. You would also um, yeah, cut the capillarity of the soil, so this also has several advantages. Another thing that is becoming more and more developed is camera assisted hose. But I would like to switch from arable cropping, which would be the majority of the fields in Germany, to permanent crops. So there's a small fraction of farms that also grow permanent crops, for example, apples or grapes, and they're restricted also to certain regions. This, I suppose, is more comparable to the situation in Thailand, as also farm sizes of wineries or tree crop farms are much smaller, and often they also have slopes. So I would like to give you a couple of examples from winery. Um, the weed control between the vines is traditionally most frequently done with retracting hose. However, also disc plows are very popular as they are very efficient. And in this particular case, you see a tractor uh, that is automatically guided. So you do not see a person in the cabin. But this, of course, is extremely expensive, but may become a solution to those farms that have large field sizes and um, of course finding the labor to compensate uh, is very very challenging over here as well. When it comes to more heavy weed infestations also crumbling rotary tillers are very interesting. You see here one in action and this would be a field three weeks after application. For more superficial weed control for example brush mulchers are used. And a more recent development is the use of fully automatic robots. However, this is not very widespread and also extremely expensive. Besides the mechanical control, there are further alternatives. So treatments with hot foam are being tested, which have the advantage that you can go relatively quickly through the vineyards as the foam remains on the weeds. You see the results here but also hot water treatments could be an option. Here you see a manual applicator, which is attached to a hot water tank. And you see the results three days, eight days, and 16 days after application. Another quite interesting approach that is currently being investigated is the application of disposable covers. So here we see one example that is oilseed rape and cellulose fiber-based or rubber-based applications. 
uh, that would be applied on the row between the vines. However, this study started last year and due to COVID, the results this year were not evaluated, but I'm very curious to find out what, um, what this will look like and how effective it is. Finally, I would like to summarize that glyphosate will probably be banned after 2023 in Germany. There are no equivalent chemical alternatives, and in most cases, farmers will switch to mechanical control. However, this might require some cropping systems to change, or some techniques will definitely change. And the companies are developing a variety of new tools to solve the solution. However, this also takes time to be implemented into practical agriculture. I would like to thank you for your attention, give a quick overview of over my references. Thank you, Rebecca, for the very sound overview about the situation in Europe at the moment, or especially in Germany. You made your example. And we see a number of uh, parallelism between uh, Germany with the planning of glyphosate in this question and Southeast Asia, and specifically uh, Thailand. All farmers are really looking for alternatives. You showed some of them, especially for, for uh, food uh, production, but also for arable land. And uh, it's the same situation as in Thailand that we cannot afford more labor as labor costs are uh, increasing and um, uh, uh, yeah, are increasing and the normal farmer cannot afford it. And now we want to see a, a little uh, different point of view from uh, Dr. Pepin Schallemarkes. He's a lead scientist uh, at, um, for impact evaluation at the World Vegetable Center, uh, situated in Bangkok as well. And uh, he will uh, point out the challenges of safe pesticide use in Southeast Asia, which is quite important to keep uh, active agents in the market. We have to use it very carefully, that uh, especially it does not go into the environment or um, uh, harm any health of the user. So, Epin, the uh, stage is yours, and I'm curious about your um, outline. Uh, thank you, Klaus. I hope you can um, can see me and hear me. Um, yeah, I would like to talk a bit about the pest management uh, of, uh, of smallholder farmers in Southeast Asia, mostly in Thailand, but also a few other countries. Um, and uh, I've been uh, studying this topic for about, uh, for about 10 years. Uh, now, let me go to the next slide. Okay, so uh, first of all, I would like to, to, uh, um, to talk a little bit about the, the challenges uh, to, uh, to safe pest management. Uh, what we have seen in, in, uh, in Thailand, Vietnam, but also other countries, is that we have very, very rapid growth of uh, pesticide use in agriculture. Uh, Thailand has uh, grown pesticide use about seven to nine percent per annum, which, which mean, basically means more than a doubling of pesticides every 10 years, and have experienced that, that for, for several decades already. Uh, so a very rapid growth of pesticide use, uh, while at the same time the agriculture productivity is not growing so fast. So you have a lot more pesticides, uh, or the, the quantity of pesticides per agriculture output is actually uh, um, increasing. So you have uh, you need more and more pesticides. Now, especially increasing fast is the use of herbicides. 81% of pesticide imports in Thailand are herbicides. Uh, which is very large. In, in other countries in Asia, like Vietnam is only about 40, 50%, but probably shows the, the relatively higher labor cost uh, in Thailand. Uh, we also find that pesticide use is not equal for all crops. We find that uh, in vegetables, for example, 10 times higher rates of pesticide use than in, uh, than in rice, uh, rice production, which just uh, re re like, uh, shows the, the, the marginal uh, uh, value of different crops. So the higher the value of the crop, the often the more the uh, pesticides that farmers are using. Uh, we also have done studies on, on, on determining what is actually the economic optimum of pesticide use and uh, how much actually of the farmer's pesticide use can be labeled as overuse. And there we find that about 80% 80, 80 in countries like Thailand, uh, Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia can be labeled as overuse. It means like an, an, an excessive use of pesticides above the, what is economically rational for a farmer to apply. So actually, they, uh, as you look at just at the economics, they could produce 80% of the, of the value of the, what farmers spend on pesticides could actually be reduced without much uh, losses in, in the crop yields. 
Now, with, uh, with most, most harm from this pesticide overuse, it's, uh, it's actually mostly the farm workers. Uh, if you think if in Thailand there are 13 million uh, uh, farmers, farm households uh, uh, employed in agriculture, most of them are directly exposed to pesticides, as you see in this uh, picture for, for Vietnam here. Uh, farmers are spraying usually by hand uh, using backpack sprayers, uh, like this lady is doing in tomato field in Vietnam, uh, overhead spraying, so all the, all the spray drift basically lands in your face. Here's a picture in, the, in, in Indonesia, a farmer spraying an onion field without any protective gear, basically. Um, so this is the typical uh, picture that you see of pesticide spraying, especially in the, like, the more remote areas, um, and, and very much in vegetable farming. So what are the drivers of this? Uh, first of all, uh, we, have, um, we have a situation in Southeast Asia that pesticides have become very cheap. Um, the price of pesticides is, has, has gone down. And uh, this is mostly stimulated by relatively cheap imports from China. Like about 80% of the pesticides in Vietnam and Thailand are imported from China. And those products are a lot cheaper than when they are imported from the US or like uh, Europe. Uh, a particular problem is that the pesticides are, are very readily available for, for, for farmers. Uh, for example, a study in Vietnam showed that there are 27,000 licensed retailers in Vietnam alone, uh, and they sell about 3,000 registered pesticide products. Um, so th that's an enormous amount, and that you can imagine that it's, that's very difficult to monitor that for, for government agencies if those uh, retailers are following the rules. Uh, what we find also that if these if farmers are advised by pesticide retailers, uh, they use 251% more pesticides than if they get the main crop protection advice from extension agents or from other farmers. Uh, so of course, retailers have an incentive to, to sell more pesticides and we see that very strongly in our data. There are also demand side factors. Uh, many farmers are like strongly um, believe that pesticides are effective and they're probably right that, that it helps them. Um, we also uh, find that, that women farmers, for example, use a lot less than, than male farmers. So if the woman, if the woman is in charge of, of crop protection, a lot less pesticides are used on the farm. We also find that if farmers have better knowledge about their pests that they're dealing with and about the natural enemies that could help uh, protect the fields, they use a lot less pesticides. Uh, so these are important factors uh, to, to consider what's driving the, the, the trends. So what to do, I think uh, our research is basically showing it is still important to, to ban high, very high risk pesticides that are difficult to manage safely at the farm level. Thailand has already banned about 99 different uh, pesticides uh, from agriculture that are considered as too, too, risk, too, too risky to handle. It's also important maybe to consider more a progressive tax uh, on, on, on the pesticides. At the moment, the same tax rate is applied on all pesticides. But if the tax rate could be based on the actual risk to an environment and to the farmers uh, or consumers health, uh, that could kind of give an economic incentive to use less, uh, less risky or less hazardous pesticides. It's also important uh, to ensure transparent and evidence uh, pesticide policies. Yeah, indeed, it should not be based on, on, uh, uh, on like anecdotal evidence, but the, the, uh, based on research is, is, is preferred. Also, what's important to consider here uh, that uh, Thailand and many other countries have done very little investments in research and development to make alternatives more widely available. Most, pest, most farmers basically use only pesticides to control the pests and diseases, but very few other like integrated pest management methods are actually applied at the farmer, at the, uh, on their farms, uh, as, our, as many of our studies have shown. Normally, if you think about an integrated pest management approach, a pesticide or insecticide, fungicide should be used as a, as a mean of last resort, not the first thing that the farmer should, uh, should, should go to when he has a pest problem. Raising farmers' knowledge of pests and diseases is very important, but also creating a market for farmers to actually uh, sell, sell the, the products at a premium if, the, if they manage to produce safe produce. So these are the, some of the, of the recommendations that, that flow from our, our research. Uh, with that, uh, some references that of our studies that we have conducted here. And uh, with that, I would like to hand over back to, uh, to Klaus. Thank you. Thank you, Pepin. That was a very uh, quick input. Thank you for that. And I see already some uh, really uh, um, interesting discussions for you we can highlight later on. But uh, first of all, I want to um, announce now Dr. Nguansi. She's uh, from the expert panel on chemical review committee. 
The Rotterdam Convention on Prior Informed Consent Procedure for Certain Hazardous Chemicals and Pesticides in the International Trade under the FAO. She's a very experienced person, uh, I would more or less say globally, on the, on the situation, especially in Southeast Asia, about why and how bans of uh, chemicals are going on. And she will tell us now the consequences to farming production after the ban of Paraquat. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to talk in this seminar today. Before going on, please allow me to introduce myself that I am Nguyen Si Thayapat a retired government official from Thai Department of Agriculture, or DOA. Before my retirement, I had served as Director of Agricultural Toxic Substances, which engaged in some parts of pesticide registration, regulation, and management in Thailand. During that period, I also chair the ASEAN Regional Expert Working Group on Harmonization of pesticide residue limits. Currently, I'm in the expert panel on chemical review committee of the Rotterdam Convention under FAO unit. Now come back to the pesticide rules in Thailand. As you are aware that our tropical climate with high temperature and abundant rainfall, variety of crops could be grown very well and heavy application of pesticides are necessary to avoid risk from pest attack. Herbicides are also becoming of major use due to shortage of labor. Besides, to ensure food security, agricultural produce are needed to be stored in larger quantities with longer times. Thus, need, need to use more pesticides to reduce post-harvest losses. This happening had caused concern over risk and hazard from pesticide residue and their adverse effect on environment. In 2002, the government had implemented and strengthened food safety control system to enhance food safety and protect consumer health. Actually, this policy aimed at development of risk-based food safety control strategies for the prevention or reduction of food hazards and foodborne diseases. However, the public perception concentrated mainly for pesticide residue in food, even though the biggest food safety challenges today is probably not from pesticides. It is probably from microbiological contamination that caught food poisoning or from unhygienic practices. The message and information spread out among consumers are mostly about pesticide residue in fruit and vegetables. Without enough evidence on quality data from monitoring, comparing with their set standards. This had resulted in negative campaign and proposal to ban some chemicals without proper risk assessment. Before the year 2000, the Department of Agriculture had already started consideration on banning pesticides that had adverse effect on human health and environment. By set up the expert working group to evaluate on concerned information obtained from research and work done in the country, as well as collecting information from international agencies and other reliable sources. The expert working group has set up the criteria in relation to whether one chemical should be banned as extremely hazardous based on the WHO classification or having CMR chronic toxicity, that means for carcinogen, mutagen, and reproductive toxicity. Or whether persistent in the environment. Under this criteria on persistence, we had banned all organochlorine pesticide used in the country. And the ban of organochlorine was done before Stockholm Convention 
had implemented their cancellation policy to the members. The other criteria are about whether having bioaccumulation in food chain or whether having adverse effect on non-target non species or having a toxic impurity in formulated products such as dioxin or having alternative which proved to be less toxic. And last but not least, it currently was banned in other countries due to health risks. Under the work done at that time, BOA had already banned almost 100 pesticides without any conflict on the decision. Afterwards, the decision was on banned chemical was submitted to the Hazardous Chemical Committee for final approval before official announcement in the Royal Gazette. Most of the chemical evaluation was done through DOA expert working group, which is contrary to the recent situation. That NGO or pressure group could send their proposals to ban pesticide directly to the hazardous com chemical committee. The final decision from the said committee had created dissatisfaction and criticism from private sectors and farmers who had been affected from the ban solution. They complained that the decision was not related to the recommendations from international organizations such as FAO and Chemical Review Committee of the Rotterdam Convention who had described as the final regulatory action for banning chemicals had to be taken as a consequence of risk evaluation with data provided have been generated according to scientific recognized method. The consequences of the banning for farmers could be expected on various problems arising from unavailability of alternatives which have same pest control properties and cost effective that will be needed for certain field crop production. Without them, crop losses can be expected, which will affect their trading as well. The suggestion for private sectors or pesticide industry to improve the situation should be necessary for them to seek opportunity to explore clearly, clearer definition from concerned organization or government sectors about the criteria for banning chemicals that should be based on risk and or use assessment, not only from hazard. How, moreover, risk assessment has to be from exposure studies. The other suggestion is to seek agreement from industry on risk management based on risk mitigation measures, such as changing formulation, changing use pattern or recommended use, restriction on applicators, etc., to reduce risk. On this occasion, I would like to remind them all to concern about pesticide product quality that have to comply with FAO specification based on percentage of active ingredient and limits of relevant impurities that can be safe to user and environment as well as to ensure the efficiency on target pests. Therefore, the improved situation between private sectors and concerned government sectors. There is a need for consistent regulation and policies to support their understanding and cooperation. When moving to farmer again, the suggestion for them to improve the situation and avoid having problems in the future. Food agricultural practices or GAP have been introduced to them with the main principles as to follow pesticide labels strictly, to select pesticides which are safe for user and environment friendly, and lastly, to observe strictly on pre harvest interval or PHI. Under this context, DOA had given much attention on promoting these activities and is assigned to be authority on certifying GAP to farmer after training and inspecting their practices. The produce from GAP farm 
can have label put on to guarantee their quality. The latest of my presentation today will touch on the alternative look solution being promoted for farmers. In reality, this recommended alternative is not new to many of us since it had been suggested a long time ago under Agenda 21 of Global Program of Action on Sustainable Development by UN 1992. As, as well as mentioned in F FAO Code of Conduct to use the same solution, that is integrated approaches. From Agenda 21, it was written as integrated pest management to be the guiding principle for pest control. It is the best option for the future as it guarantees yields, reduce costs, is environmentally friendly, and contribute to the sustainability of agriculture. More elaboration is integrated pest management or IPM means the careful consideration of all available pest, con pest control techniques and subsequent integration of appropriate measures that discourage the development of pest population and keep pesticides and intervention to level that are economically justified and reduce or minimize risk to human health and the environment. IPM emphasized the growth of a healthy crop with the least possible disruption to a grow ecosystem and encourages natural pest control mechanisms. Under this elaboration, farmers could be educated on trying to reduce pesticide usage and seeking for alternative control measures, such as using pest resistant crop varieties, biological control, cultural management, botanical pesticide, etc. All these techniques and knowledge had been on trial and written in many research papers or published in the textbook by experts worldwide on many specific crops. In, in conclusion, the IPM technique is not as easy as using chemical pesticides. It is quite complicated with time and energy consuming. However, it is worthwhile and helps solve the problem of adverse effects from pesticides and eventually will protect human health and environment. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so far also to Dr. Nguyen Sri. Um, now I want to ask all speakers to switch on their camera at least, and if they are, I want to talk also their mic. And I also uh, want to um, offer the Q&A button to all of the audience to really ask questions. We already have a few of them. And at the bottom of your screen, you can even add more Q&As um, for our speakers. So we have already one question. Yeah, this is one to Rebecca um, directly. So the slides we can share later on. But I have one quite interesting um, question from Paul Comeny. I hope I uh, pronounce his name uh, rightly. He's uh, asking um, if uh, a heavier level of regulation and data recording of applications of third parties will benefit to a, a possible solution to uh, improve the use of pesticides. This is mainly uh, a first point for, for Europe where documentation is really a big issue at the moment and farmers really struggle with uh, using a lot of time for documenting and uh, showing the data to uh, officials and administration and they will be um, regulated uh, through that. Would that be uh, also a solution for uh, Southeast Asia? I guess it could be quite difficult to make a, a sound documentation of the use and application of pesticides. Dr. Veronica, how is your point of view on that topic?
Do we have still connection to Thailand? If you like, I can talk a little bit about the situation in yeah. Europe in the meantime. So um, over here, it's like this, that each uh, crop protection measurement, each chemical measurement needs to be recorded. And farmers are aware of the fact that it was very likely also controlled. So they don't, they don't overuse it typically. So this works very, very well over here. Of course, there would be the odd farmer where something could go wrong, but in general, this works really well over here and pesticide applications for the farmers are safe. Um, also because we have the machinery um, to apply them safely here. Um, additionally, each applicator of pesticides has to prove that he or she has the expertise to apply the pesticides. So this has to be updated every two years. So every pesticide applicator also needs to go on a course and get educated. Otherwise it's forbidden to apply the pesticides. Um, but yeah, I imagine that this could be very, very uh, difficult to implement uh, in Thailand. So questions to uh, uh, Dr. Pepin or Dr. Veronica. Um, is there any uh, um, idea if this could be a solution for Thailand as well, or is it uh, due to the very vast number of, of small farmers really not to, to do actually in Southeast Asia? Yeah, for, I may, if I may, like, uh, it's possible to do that for certified, in, certified farmers, like who are Global Gap or QGAP certified, that is a requirement perhaps. For all farmers, that's impossible because you have 13 million uh, uh, smallholder farmers. Uh, so it's impossible to have the capacity just to, to, to check those, those records. Also, of course, many farmers uh, in remote areas are like, still largely illiterate. So it's, uh, you cannot expect them to fill in forms that would be, be un unfair to have such a, impose such a requirement. Uh, so we have to be careful with that, imposing such a requirement on all farmers. But those farmers who, who go for international markets could uh, uh, are probably are doing that already to some extent. And uh, between you already said that uh, um, education of farmers would improve the situation as well, especially uh, in the uh, uses protection and in environmental protection. On the other hand, uh, Dr. Veronica said that farmers are well educated and know how to use the, the chemicals. So there is some uh, um, uh, um, uh, disconnection between those two uh, statements. Um, is it because of the, we are talking about different uh, um, sizes of farms or uh, educated farmers or um, how do you see that? Uh, well, th that that matters. Of course, there's there's a lot of variation between uh, between those 13 million farmers in, in Thailand. But uh, in general, farmers are aware of the risks that they are exposed to when spraying pesticides. That 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 we find. Uh, what they are not aware of fully is the alternatives to pesticides. So they often uh, take pesticides because it's convenient, it's effective, it's efficient, it's available, right? But uh, if you ask them what if you didn't use the pesticides, how else could you control this particular pest? They, ha they often have uh, little to no clue about how to do it and no one there to help them basically uh, to teach them the integrated pest management principles, for example. Uh, that's, that's, that, that knowledge is currently not available at the farm level. Dr. Veronica, are you still with us? Yes, yes. Um, it is, it's exactly as Dr. Pepin has said. Um, you know, that's, that is why the industry is working very hard together with the, the, the government to ensure that, you know, that uh, the penetration of education goes, you know, in the broader spectrum. But as, as you know, like your small farmers, 13 million small farmers, that is something that... Um, it's very hard, but it will take time. But if we don't do it, if we don't start, then you know we we'll never get there. So um, that is why um, the agricultural chemical companies are working very hard together among the three associations to ensure that you know uh, we support the government on this aspect. Because like you, if not, you know we're going to be attacked anyway. That that we are evil. We're selling chemicals. So so that that is the the part of the industry that um, 
we have to do. Actually, I, I tell you, we have been doing this for the past 50 years, but as the numbers of the farmers in Thailand are very high, and um, talking about um, the strategy of the government that they would like the, um, Thailand to be 4.0. But in fact, you also have to accept that, you know, especially for small farms, they are not up to that league yet, right? So, um, so anything manual is still the way to go for them. They are not that high tech yet. And at the same time, um, I, I always use this example at the, uh, at my house the, you know, the helpers, they never understand the word concentration. So when they use the concentrated, um, um, washing detergent, they will also believe that, you know, the more you use, the more effective it will become. So this is also the same application for, for, for the farmers. They always believe that, okay. You know, I'm used to it. I don't have to wear anything. I don't have to wear boots. I don't have to wear PPE. Of course, PPE is out of the question. We are in a hot climate. So um, the more I use, the more effective it will become. And I'm used to it. So no measurement, no nothing. Just mix it like, you know, what they are accustomed to. So that is very risky. So that is why the training is very important to us. Yeah, perfect. And that we actually cannot do without the industry. That, that's the same thing in Germany as well. So industry and politics is working very strongly together to get knowledge to the farmer, actually. Um, we have another question from Jody Harris. I think it's quite interesting. Um, she uh, considers, of course, the trade-offs between the, the advantages of, of uh, chemical pesticides for better yield, for, for healthy plants and uh, good food. On the other side, we have disadvantages of environmental effects, health, health effects. So also from the industry side and also from research side, uh, what uh, can we do to um, uh, manage those trade-offs to get a better decision uh, base to which uh, um, pesticides are banned or used uh, differently? Is there research going on to focus especially on this trade-off? Or is it mainly uh, oriented on the environmental and health aspect? What is your opinion there? Maybe Veronica, because you have a good overview from the industry side. So how to deal with the trade-off between uh, healthy plants, good yield, and on the other side, um, uh, environmental effects and health effects, and how to deal with this uh, um, conflict? You know, the, the thing is, every chemical is toxic and we have to admit that fact, right? Uh, that is why the training of uh, the uh, responsible and safe use is important because, you know, uh, once you use it correctly, it will not be harmful. So, so that is the thing that we are trying to, to convey that um, without um, proper training, it can be risky, it can be harmful. So um, does, that, does that answer the question? Yeah, more or less it is. So, but I want also to see the opinion of, of uh, Pepin, because you are also a researcher. Do you see that uh, we need more research on especially these trade-offs to make better uh, decisions in the end? Yes, I, I think this, this is an important aspect. And uh, of course, those trade-offs are complex. i um, give you one example for a recent study in Vietnam showed that, that because consumers are concerned about the safety of, of, of vegetables they eat, just the, the perception of consumers that, best, that vegetables are unsafe, they consume 14% less vegetables than they would otherwise do. So the, the perception of consumers about safety already reduces their decisions to eat, buy less vegetables, for example, which is very serious. So even if it, that doesn't mean like that there's a, that pesticides are dangerous or those vegetables are dangerous, it's just by the perception of consumers that th those vegetables that they find in the market are unsafe for, for human consumption. And that actually influences the decision. And that's very critical, I think, for healthy food products like vegetables and fruits that are actually under consumed in, in the whole region. Uh, so it is an uh, important trade-off that, that I feel need to address, and there are many trade-offs in this, this question. Thank you. So there's a lot to do, I, I would say. Absolutely. Um, and there's another question from Nicolas Sell. 
um, to, I, I just read it down, uh, to fully make a transition to alternative weed control methods. Do you think uh, government incentives and funding will be necessary? So maybe uh, Rebecca, can you give an uh, uh, um, example of Germany, how our uh, government is working on incentives and funding, especially also for research? Maybe you have an example and then we can switch over to Southeast Asia, what could be the idea? Uh, yeah, thank you. So there are several ways. Oh, maybe somebody still has the microphone on. Um, so there are several ways how farmers are financially supported in order to um, produce crops more sustainably. Um, so we do already have relatively high standards and um, actually there, there are EU fundings for the farmers but also currently we have um, other uh, other programs going on, for example, when it comes to water protection, that different stakeholders come together and there would be at least partial rewards for farmers who voluntarily reduce the amount of pesticides applied uh, in order to have less residues in the groundwater. Uh, and often this is very well adapted by the farmers, despite the fact um, that it has some financial disadvantages. Uh, on, on the other hand, it will require more labor as mechanical weed control um, takes longer. And also there have to be more treatments done during the season. Thank you. So I understand in, in Germany, also in Europe, it's a big discussion about uh, getting paid for environmental services. So if you use less pesticides and uh, make a better uh, resource protection, you may get uh, uh, more subsidies or uh, um, be supported by the government somehow. Could that be also an idea in Southeast Asia? And, uh, because uh, there is a lot to do actually, and um, also in research. In, in Europe, we got a, a lot of money for research in this regard to find alternatives. What is going on in, in Thailand at the moment or in Southeast Asia? Um, if you talk about the, the subsidy, subsidized from the government, um, the government normally have to understand first that, you know, um, to have the alternatives as machinery or, or if you're talking about uh, going towards 4.0 as a government strategy, um, Thai farmers are, you know, are not like uh, farmers in Australia, for example, that are wealthy and they can't afford such a thing. So um, government subsidy is very important. And also, um, if they would suggest the alternatives as machinery or drone, the government should be the one who invests in, uh, you know, initial investment on this and, and um, can, can use it as a rental uh, machinery or drone for the farmers. Because, you know, uh, but that won't increase the cost for the farmers because the farmers now also have to pay for the, the spray service provider anyway. So um, I believe that um, the subsidy has, has to happen there. If not, it won't happen because the, the farmers won't be able to afford, you know, um, hard machinery or technology that far. Thank you. Maybe what do you think? Is, should there be more uh, funding for uh, uh, proper research or paying the farmers directly to, to improve their methods? Uh, I think so. I think, I think the countries in Southeast Asia are like very much under investing in, their, in, in research in this type of uh, alternative agriculture, or not alternative, but alternative crop protection measures. Uh, we are focusing too much on, on simple solutions. Uh, but also thinking about system solutions and, and agroecology, uh, integrated pest management, very few of those technologies are actually available to farmers. And I see very little like uh, research investments in that. So it's, it's really important. Yeah. Of course, also the private sector can contribute because a lot of those, for example, biopesticides are widely uh, applied in, in other countries, but not yet available, for example, in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, they need to be uh, validated, imported, and maybe stimulated the, the private sector also to, to sell those uh, uh, as alternatives to, to the chemical pesticides that are currently being sold. Okay, thank you. We have another question, and uh, uh, maybe I already can answer it. So there is a question about 
Well, typhosate is also used in Indonesia on uh, palm plantations and so on, and uh, Europe, especially Germany, imports a lot of uh, palm oil for, for energy aspects. And the question is, uh, will uh, the EU after 2023, if the ban is really coming from glyphosate, is still importing such uh, products? So I can only tell from the history that, that uh, GMO is also forbidden in, in, in Europe or in Germany to, to, to use actually in the field. However, we are still dependent on uh, soybean imports from South America to feed our, our animals. So um, we still, it's forbidden in our country, but it is allowed to import. However, there's a, a new market uh, um, emerging that uh, we can sell products better when they are produced without GMO plants or without GMO uh, feed. So this could also be the case if the ban is really coming, that there is a new market emerging that uh, products who also uh, were not produced by using glyphosate in other countries may have uh, a better market in, in Germany as well or in, in Europe. Um, Sabine, you're uh, working with, with vegetable markets and so on. Do you see something similar that people will um, pay more money for products which were uh, produced more sustainable in, in a way? Yeah. Yeah, for vegetables and, and fruits, uh, certification is an important uh, pathway. Uh, Thailand has been one of the most advanced countries in Southeast Asia with its public uh, QGAP standard, which has uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of farmers have been certified uh, using that standard, uh, which is really, quite, is really impressive. Um, of course, there's organic uh, standard, but the adoption is still relatively low. But we, but we do need to recognize that those standards are in increasing in the market a lot. So I think that's a, that's a really encouraging sign. Also, of course, the consumer's awareness and the whole discussion about pesticides that are, is now in the media, that actually helps uh, to stimulate consumer interest in those certified products and, and will probably also have some positive effect on the on growing market share for certified produce. Yeah. So it's important. Thank you. Dr. Veronica, how do you see this maybe new emerging market with products without glyphosate? Is it something which could really get an amount which is really relevant or will it be only a, a small niche uh, for a few people who can afford it? No, I, I, I don't think it's a niche market actually. Um, it's affordable. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. So this could be an, uh, a future site or one one way we can go if it re is really banned and there is no alternative that we really can work on that as well. I uh, only have one last question, which is quite uh, uh, specific to Rebecca, I guess. There was one question about um, using glyphosate in monocultures and so on and uh, how it works with resistances to herbicides. Rebecca, I know you are working especially on that topic, which will be really relevant for uh, other countries as well. Um, can you give a comment on that question? What about resistances and glyphosate or other herbicides? Thank you. Um, so we currently use glyphosate between the seasons in some cases if we want to control very difficult to control weeds. And we have certain regions where grass weeds have accumulated that have multiple resistances to different modes of actions. And particularly when this becomes the case, farmers are really thinking about using glyphosate to keep the seed bank as low as possible. But for that reason, it is very important to have already now integrated approaches to avoid resistance from evolving. And in Europe, for example, for these weeds, it is very helpful to have a very um, diverse crop rotation and to alternate um, winter crops, as I had shown before, that are sown in autumn with spring crops. Uh, that are sown in spring because like this there would always be different kinds of weeds emerging and not the one kind would accumulate and would have the opportunity to evolve resistance. Um, I think this is very important to apply integrated measures as early as possible. 
Okay, another uh, aspect to consider actually, so not only uh, active agents to uh, fight herbicide um, weeds, but also to use them properly, not to uh, raise any um, resistances and have still one tool to use it. So finally, uh, with a look on my watch, uh, I, we are uh, a lot over time, but it was very nice and good and fruitful discussion. I want to thank you all, all the speakers, Dr. Veronica, to share your insights from the industry and market point of view. That was really very uh, uh, interesting and very um, uh, wonderful to have you here in this talk. Also, um, Rebecca, again, thank you very much for your uh, insight, for giving us insight from the European or German side. While well, we are looking uh, um, with uh, uh, great, um, well, tension to 2023 if we still are allowed to use diversate and if any alternative really works well. And Pepin, also from your side, thank you very much to uh, give us uh, insight into the small farming situation for small farmers and the uses in the rural areas. There has to be something uh, improved, especially in, in knowledge and protection of the, of the farmers as uh, um, individuals. So thank you for your contribution, and also Dr. Nuansri, who is not with us, but gave us a very sound uh, uh, view on the uh, farming production up the band of paraquat and uh, possibly glyphosate as well. And of course, everybody who listened to the talk, the audience all over the world, thank you very much. And one last remark, that everybody who joined um, this afternoon, you got with the email of invitation, you got your login data for the digital platform of Architectica Asia. So use it, use the platform to exchange between uh, each other and also to join the monthly digital talks we will have from this day on every month until May 2021. And at latest in May 2021, we will meet personally in Bangkok. Thank you so far. Have a good time. See you next time. Thank you and goodbye.